out that the sun shines down its power to all the world and makes the wind blow strong as it will. I want to hope gentle rains can fall upon the land so lovely earth can stay lovely still. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the 458th edition of Energy Week with George Harvey and the amazing Tom Fennell. In the flesh. In the flesh. <laughs> For those of you who are keeping score, <laughs> uh, Energy Week number 457 was a special. That's what it said. It was a special. Yep. yep. I gave the keynote speech for the for the 50th anniversary um, di director's meeting of the New England Coalition on Nuclear Pollution. Good. They seemed to enjoy that. There was an audience of about six people. There was a snowstorm going on and everybody was afraid of <laughs> COVID-19. And we did have some people who were on, on, a, on, a, um, on a call. Well, let's uh, see, a I want to get a picture of uh, that engine up there and I don't know how to do Well, it. Let's, let's put the engine on. There you there go. There we go. There you go. Okay. Now, put um, that engine up. I, this is uh, material that I get every day and put up at my blog, geoharvey.com. And if you scroll down on the screen that you're looking at, chances are you're going to find something that will give you an ability to download a file or go to a website or both that uh, contains the, the material that Tom and I use for developing this. Yeah, you give us a link and the link... Yeah. You click on the link and you get the original article. And, and Tom does it every week, so don't tell me that it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes these articles are well worth reading. That's right. I'll try to alert you to some of them because yep. uh, we could develop the entire show to some of these articles. Just we one could. Article. We could, yeah. Well, let's start with this one here. We'll take a look at a motor called a Terrier. This is uh, an article from Clean Technica. Well, this is about a guy named Konigsegg which has the ability to squeeze out. He has a, developed an ability to squeeze extraordinary amounts of power out of internal combustion Small engines. Small internal combustion yeah. engines. And now his company has two breakthrough products that could, could transform the world of electric cars. And you're looking at one of them up there. And if you look at it closely, you'll see it's two smaller errors, <laughs> two, two smaller motors. motors. Yeah. That, that are called uh, quarks, connected by an inverter. Wow. So you, you, if you look real closely, you, you can see you can two see identical it. things. Yeah, with a, yeah. And with the reason an you need an inver inverter is the batteries them. are DC and the motors are AC. Right. And you can see that in there, that, that thing in the middle that says Konigsegg is the uh, inverter. This thing is 12. That's, that's a regular can of soda. So Yeah, called Clean Koenigsegg. <laughs> it's it's got a, its own it's name of, soda. of the soda. <laughs> this thing is 12 by 13 inches. The, the, the motors are. There's two of them on here. By, by 4.4 4. 4 inches. And then the inverter is between them. Well, the quark engine, which is, you're seeing two of them here. Yeah. Has no need for transmission. Yeah. So the RPM of the motor is just right from the beginning. Yeah. But it does need an inverter because it yeah. operates on... on AC and the battery but source. But the two motors are independent of each other, so you don't have a, a differential. Exactly. This so we, what you're looking at there on the screen, put I'll put it up. I'll put it up again. I'm not interested in it. What you're looking there at the screen is two quarks. You can see them with an inverter sandwiched between them. Yeah. And now, is each quark 335? Well, I'll, I'll read this. Well, yeah, puts Christian out 670 von, horsepower in a package yeah. that weighs just 187 pounds. Okay, Christian von Koenigsegg has turned his talents to electric motors and drivetrains. One result is the quark, a compact three-phase electric motor measuring just 12 by 13 by 4.4 inches. So there's two quarks in that picture. Yep. And that puts out an eye-popping 335 horsepower and... Each of those two is 335 horsepower. So you've got this motor. What is the weight of it? I don't have it in front of me. You 187 might. pounds. And a it's regular a, car engine with this transmission is about 500 pounds. Yeah. And it's seven, 670 horsepower at 100 and 
eighty. Some That's exactly pounds. right. Well, two, two, three hundred thirty-fives is six hundred seventy. <laughs> That's a this lot. Is, of... This thing is amazing. Yeah, this really is amazing. And I, you could use that thing to go fast. Very fast. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, should we go on? Yeah, we got another picture here. We do, and this is a picture of a snowstorm. And this, how about that? This um, show, uh, article is from CNN. It could be Brattleboro, but it's not. It's not, no. So let's see. Let's. We didn't. We haven't had a snow like that this year. Not this year. Not at all. We've had very little snow. This In year. fact, at my at my place, the lowest temperature we had was barely below zero. Oh yeah. Yeah. We've had like, some below zero over we, where I am. Yeah. My car froze one, one night. You, I couldn't get you, in. Yeah, a couple of weeks ago. Well, natural gas spikes 16% ahead of a winter storm. Natural gas futures rose 16% on Wednesday as engineering as energy markets brace for a powerful winter storm that threatens to derail production just as demand rises. Now, this didn't actually happen. Natural gas futures closed at $5.50 per million BTUs. You know, the, the way we measure things is just batty. <laughs> That's a rise of 55% since the price sank to $3.56 on, de on December 30th. Well, there was a good three-minute video in this at this link. Yeah. And one of the things they talk about is some of the problems that are happening between Russia and the Ukraine. Oh, man. And as they're, as they're saying this, and I'm reading it, I'm hearing it on the radio. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Stuff's going on there that we don't know much about, but uh, yes. it has bad possibilities yes. and, and good possibilities. And I think that, I th well, the, you know, there was something that, that um, Jennifer Granholm said today. Yeah. Or she said it yesterday, I guess. It was in the news today. It went up the blog. We no, were talking she's about the energy secretary? It. She's the energy secretary. Yeah. And she said renewable energy has the potential to be the issue that pr creates world peace. That's an interesting concept. Yeah. That's a very interesting concept. Yeah. And Vladimir Putin, I think, is afraid that he's going to lose sales of natural gas and coal. And he wants to you know, take over the Ukraine because m much of the nat natural gas that he it goes goes, right through, the goes right through the Ukraine. So. And I think that if somebody could convince him that Russia is the biggest country in the world, it's got lots of natural resources, and it could it could be a, a source of energy and and materials for making energy for the rest of the world. And he's he's just not cashing in on that. Russia could be very much richer than it is if it faced. For, uh, renewable energy, realistically. That's what I'm saying. That's a good point. Okay, should we go well, on? According to this article, a major winter storm could force people to crank up the heat, oh, would it? driving up the demand for natural gas. Yeah, yeah. And some production could shut down, down to unus due to unusually cold temperatures like last year. Right. Okay, and that created deadly blackouts in Texas. That's right. Okay, our next item is from Environment and yeah, Energy we, Leader. We've got a picture here. And we have a picture of the GM Renaissance Center. Or as, that, as that, some people say, Renaissance. That's corporate headquarters. That's corporate headquarters for, for GM. General Motors. In that's Detroit. right. What do you Interesting have for a looking building. Yeah. What do you have for a title? General Motors to power three automotive plants with clean energy. GM made a new pledge to power Michigan automotive plants in Flint, Burton, and Wyoming. That is Wyoming, comma, Michigan. Wyoming, the county of Wyoming. Yeah. The state of, city of Wyoming, not in, the state. In Michigan. Um, with clean energy, GM partnered with Consumers Energy for the pro project. It brings GM closer to its target of sourcing 100% renewable energy in the U.S. by 2025. Well, these moves will offset 235,000 tons of carbon dioxide annually. So they're working in the right direction. Yeah, they are. Well, GM has also announced new commercial applications for its, and this is a trademark, Hydrotech, hydrogen fuel cell energy storage technology, taking it beyond its use in vehicles. Okay, so they're getting on the ball yep. here. Yep. Up to okay. Friday, February 4th. We, got we are up to Friday, up February 4th. 
And we got these, a picture. This picture is is the prices of natural gas and electricity. Well, it's interesting to see that they march almost in unison. Yeah. Um, well, that's the New England daily natural gas and electricity prices and the Algonquin Citygate spot natural gas prices. Yeah, they march pretty much in uni unison. Well, New England natural gas and electricity prices increase on supply constraints and a high demand. The spot natural gas price at the Algonquin City Gate, a trading hub and benchmark for natural gas prices in New England, averaged $20.55 per million British thermal units, which is BTUs, <clears throat> during January, the highest monthly average price since February of 2014. Well, as you can see from the picture, and I'm going to bring it up again, they're marching in unison. Yeah, they are. They're different numbers, but they're exact, almost exactly the same curve. Yes. Um, I think one of them is electricity and the other is natural gas. That's exactly what it is. The one yeah. on top is natural gas and the one on the bottom. No, one on top is electricity. Yeah. The one on the bottom is, is natural gas. Yep. Well, price spikes in New England will likely continue. Yes. Several factors account for this. And the factors are weather-driven load increases. Okay, constraints on a region's constraints on a region's interstate natural gas pipelines. Yes. Okay, and five. And this is important. Limited incremental liquid natural gas supplies. Yes. And the article goes into detail explaining each of those three. But if we did it here, we'd be here till next Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> well, it would give us, you know, Wednesday off next week. <laughs> Okay, yeah, I'm going to give, up here. A, give you a, this picture. I believe that's an oil terminal in Rotterdam. Well, it says it's in Amsterdam. Oh, it's in Amsterdam. <laughs> okay. I think I thought it was in Rotterdam too, because that's their biggest terminal. But well, do you know that it says oil tank king? I can't think in of Amsterdam. I can't think of Rotterdam without thinking a bad joke. <laughs> when I was like in second grade. The little boy says, Daddy, is Rotterdam a bad word? And the father says, no, why? And the little boy says, well, my teacher has poison ivy, and I hope it'll Rotterdam arm off. <laughs> now, what do I do oh, to well. get this thing to uh, scroll? Don't here? repeat that joke. <laughs> no. What do I do to get this thing to scroll? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I don't either. Huh. Well, I got you up here. I okay. Don't... Ah, so uh, it's the other the other mouse. European oil facilities hit by cyber attacks. Yes, this is from the BBC. Multiple oil transport and storage companies across Europe are dealing with cyber attacks. IT systems have been disrupted at oil tanking in Germany, C Invest in Belgium, and Evos in the Netherlands. In total, dozens of terminals with oil oil storage and transport across the world have been affected. And by the way, the reason why you shouldn't tell that joke yeah. is because it's too dumb. <laughs> <laughs> well, from the article here, you know, look at, people see me so they know who's talking. The attacks occurred over the weekend, but experts caution against assuming this is a coordinated attack. Most liquid transportation is still operational. So what they're suspecting is the attacks are ransomware. Okay, where the hackers scramble data and make computer systems inoperable until they are paid a ransom. Yeah. So they're doing this for the bucks. Yeah, that's what they do. This disruption comes, as we've already mentioned, as tensions remain high between Ukraine and Russia. And watch this space for further developments. Yes, absolutely. Things are developing over there. Yes, they are. And they will continue well, well, to do we so. We've got a nice picture coming this up This is here. an interesting picture. See if I can get that picture. Yeah, that's a here. good idea. There you go. And in case you want to know, those those things are wildebeests, or in German, wildebeesten. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a wildebeest is, migration. I guess it is. This is from a Carbon Brief. Does renewable energy threaten efforts to conserve biodiversity on land? In our study published in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, we suggest, and of course this is people at Carbon Brief talking, while conflicts between renewables and protected areas do occur, overlap need not be as severe as previously suggested. 
with appropriate policy and regulatory controls. Well, this is a long article. Yeah. There's a lot of meat in it. If you've got about two or three days, I suggest you read it. <laughs> <laughs> Tom has a hard time doing all the homework for the show. <laughs> the world is facing climate and ecological crises, which occasionally pull in the same direction. For example, restoring faltering coastline ecosystems, mangroves, and salt marshes sequester carbon. Okay, so they're working together. Mm -hmm. At other times, the crises may seem to antagonize each other. And rapid renewable energy expansion is a key part of decarbonizing global energy systems, but it may take up land precious to the planet's wildlife. Mm -hmm. And they're showing us these guys, these, these wildebeest. You ever see a wildebeest up close? No. They're yeah, ugly. No. <laughs> well, there's a lot of, you know, are they as ugly as, um, as warthogs? I say they, they are, yeah. So? They're, they look like a cross between a buffalo and a cow. It doesn't sound ugly. Or, yeah. they're, they're supposedly <laughs> antelopes, but. Uh, they're, yeah, well. Well, when I was a kid, I lived near the Bronx Zoo, so I, I was familiar with these things. Yep. Okay. Well, on Saturday, February the 5th, coming we, up. We are, and we have a plant a picture, Vogel plant photograph. Vogel. Let's see if we can get a picture that's, of plant That's Vogel. two co cooling towers, and to the right of them are two much, much smaller, although they're still pretty big, um, containment buildings. So those are the reactors. Those are where the reactors are. And there's uh, two cooling towers, and I notice one thing, What's the that? absence of chimneys. Yeah, I've seen <laughs> chimneys at um, at nuclear plants, but they're not shaped the way they are at coal burning power plants. They tend to be kind of wide at the bottom and then very rapidly tapering to something that's pretty Almost thin. Almost like the cooling towers. Yeah, but they're very thin by comparison. But they're tall and thin. Nuclear power colon, CO2 fix or a cost disaster? Okay, this is from E&E &E News. It is, as I mentioned, I think it's a long article. It is an issue the industry has not properly addressed. The costs for two reactors at Plant Vodal in Georgia are up dramatically. In fact, the actual costs of 75 of, the, of more than 90 existing nuclear power reactors in the United States exceeded the initially co estimated costs of the units by over 200%. According to the U.S. Department of Energy. We've talked about Vodal on his show before. Yeah. It was supposed to lead to a resurgence of larger reactors in the 2000s. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't work. It isn't, <laughs> it isn't doing it, it isn't doing anything. Yeah. It remains the only nuclear power construction project in the United States. Its price tag is twice an earlier budget. And the project is, are you ready for this one? Yeah. More than seven years behind schedule. Right. Okay, so somebody's not doing something right. Well, the only time I'll believe that this thing is going to be finished on schedule is when they say... It can't be finished on schedule. No, no, no. <laughs> they keep changing the schedule. If they say it's scheduled to be open today, then I will believe it's possible. <laughs> well, plummeting natural gas prices from fracking led the electric companies to pull back on their nuclear plants. Yeah. It's the economy, stupid. And now... The, the, the uh, prices of solar and wind power and batteries are so low. They're getting so low that you... There's, it's pointless to think about nuclear power. And even though nuclear power has much cheaper fuel, it's still got a lot of problems. And the biggest they problem is unsolved. Problems. What do you do with the nuclear waste? Yeah. They haven't figured that one out. No, they haven't. And the way that I figure it is that in order for a nuclear plant to be profitable, it's going to have to do two things, one of which is be, ha, have, a, have a plan for the nuclear waste that, it, that they can prepare for. Three things, actually. Another one is be able to put away money for decommissioning. And the third thing is, combined with those first two, they're going to have to be able to sell electricity at under four cents per kilowatt hour. And they're not going to be able to do it, I don't think. Well, <laughs> I mean, I'm not seeing, make a profit. <laughs> no, I'm seeing power purchase agreements for solar, wind, and batteries under four under cents. Under four cents. And those the, that combination, you're you're it's basically unbeatable. yeah, you're basically good. Twenty to four seven, and 
the nuclear power plants... Well, we're changing. The world, the yeah, times they are the, changing. The nuclear plants typically come in at over 10 cents. And how are they going to go below four? I don't know. Shut down. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> well, well yeah. you know, Tom, today they had a... They had a thing which I put in the blog. It's going to be it's going to be next week, but they were saying this big breakthrough in in um, in energy was a was a, a, a fusion plant in the UK where for five in I'm sorry in five so that was seconds the we had a picture of it. No, there was this is more recent. More it's recent, same thing. David. In five seconds. They were able to produce that's five seconds. That's a tremendous time for them. Yeah, fifty-nine megajoules of electricity of energy. Now that's, that's trans- smaller than the, the nail on my little finger. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's the equivalent of sixteen and, and a quarter kilowatt hours. But you're going to you're going to be operating it at the efficiency of thermal power plants. So you're going to be talking about maybe six kilowatt hours here. So. Six kilowatt hours is about a dollar twenty worth of electricity in Vermont with high electric costs. We've put billions of dollars into this over the last seventy years, and they're claiming a huge success because they produced a dollar twenty worth of electricity. Sorry. Well, a long time ago, I lived in Princeton, New Jersey. Yeah. And one of my neighbors was a PhD working for a company that did fusion. Was working on fusion. Yeah. And I remember saying to him, what we really needed was uh, something like we did to develop the atomic bomb. as a real... And he said, you can't do it. He said, there are steps that have to be taken one at a time, yep. and there's no way you can accelerate you those steps. You can't do it all at once. Yeah. So here it is 40 years later, and uh, they're still saying it's going to be another 30 years. Let's lead that into the... the um... Well, we've got a picture here. Yeah, we've got a picture of an easy jet. That's what it says, EasyJet. And this is from Clean Technica. Comes from Call Me Fred, by the way. <laughs> yeah, it comes from a guy whose name is Call Me Fred, which is, in, in case you're interested, this is the same guy who is Call M. Fred. Huh? In middle initial M. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What do you well, got? the airlines call for an end to the loopholes in the carbon market. And back European climate measures. Yeah, this is, by the way, EasyJet is one of the airlines that did make this call. Uh-huh. Uh, four airlines and climate mobility group T&E are calling for equal rules to apply to all flights departing from European air- airports, regardless of their destination, in order for European measures to decarbonize um, activation by aviation by 2050. Well, regardless of destination, let me clear that up because they got local planes flying out. Right. And you got international planes. Yeah. You know, transatlantic planes. And they have been operating by different rules, Mm -hmm. which in a way is logical. Yes. You know, because they do have to operate under different rules. But what they're what they're saying here is, and this is from the article, departing long haul flights represent just six percent of all flights. But they generate 51% of the emissions. Yes. Okay. So t this company, and the four airlines say it's vital that this effort is shared equally among all the actors, no exemptions. Right. And there's a little, little bit of a takeaway. Take it is absurd that people flying to Madrid or Budapest have to pay carbon taxes, but far more polluting trips to New York or Singapore are exempt. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. The whole industry has to pay, play its part. This includes the long-haul airlines. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, our next item is from Clean Technica. And we've got a picture coming up here. We have a picture of, of a construction, construction site. going on. There's what a lot of energy. There? There's a lot of, huh? I'm wondering what they're constructing there. There's I don't a lot know. of rebars. There's a lot of rebars. There's and a lot of concrete. There's wood, a lot of energy that's looks consumed. Like wood, wooden, are they wooden planks or are they, are they rectangular pipes? I don't know. I think they're probably wooden planks. Okay. Uh, let's get As this I, guy up This here is from Clean Technica. What do you have for a title? Sustainable construction, quote, modern approaches to traditional practices. Right. As the mainstream construction techniques have progressed in speed and cost, there is a growing realization that continuing in the direction of traditional practices is having negative impacts on our, our environment, 
our communities and our quality of life? Well, for centuries, we have been constructing everything on traditional practices. Building on those traditions has landed us where we are today, in a position of necessity for more sustainable construction practices. You know, as you're talking, Tom, I'm sitting here thinking, Abraham Lincoln, as you know, grew up in a log cabin. We have 330 million people in this country. I wonder how, wh whether it would be possible for us to build a log cabin for everybody. <laughs> We'd run out of forest. Possible, we would run out of forest, I would bet you, before yeah, we... Probably before we ran out of people. Yeah. Well, what is, what is holding us back? The actual cost increase is less than 2%. Yeah. I'd say one word, inertia. Yeah, inertia. Well, the initial cost of using <clears throat> alternative materials and methods might rise slightly if we consider energy, process, conservation, and labor improvements, we will often find that the added costs balance over time. Yes, absolutely. Okay, we have our most joyous picture coming yeah, up. Yeah, we've got a picture coming up here. This is a good picture. How about that? That yeah. guy looks like he is he's having, having a good time. fun. Yeah, he's having a good time. Yeah. For those who want to know, that's a humpback whale. Yeah, and it's yelling. You it's can actually huge. hear it if you... <laughs> If you're if you were there, you could have heard this. It was yelling, no. "Yippee!" <laughs> yes. Well, Iceland will end whaling from 2024 amid a controversy and amid controversy and falling demand. Well, <laughs> I think there's more controversy than there is demand. Well, there's much, not much demand anymore for whale meat. They had they had in three years they had one minke whale that was caught, one that they ate. Well, it was rendered into, into food. Well, Iceland. Iceland. Oh, yeah. You're, just, you're supposed to say that. <laughs> Iceland will end whaling from 2024 amid dwindling demand and continued controversy. Svandis, Svar, Svava daughter, Svava's daughter, Iceland's minister of fisheries. You know, you, you try to get me to pronounce a name in Icelandic, <laughs> and I can't even pronounce English anymore. Iceland's Minister of Fisheries and Agriculture wrote that whale hunting had lost much of its economic significance. In well, America. Iceland is unusual in that when a woman is born into a company, into a country whose name would be like Johnson, they change it to John's daughter. Yeah, well, they, they don't have last names. That's their last name. That's the last the, name. The but it's not they, really they a last a name. family name, but they don't Her kids it. are not going to be named. No. You know, and <laughs> the family it, name is kept on the on the mantelpiece, and they don't use it for anything. Well, the the understanding that I had was that there are so many people who who are named, you know, <laughs> Johnson, or, <laughs> who are named Hunt's son. daughter or something like that. That they they organize the um, phone book by uh, by profession. Do they? Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. There are a few justifications to authorize whale hunting beyond 2024. Whale hunting has had not, not much has not had much economic significance to Iceland in recent years. Japan has been the largest buyer of whale meat for human consumption. And now they have take, taken up whaling again. Consumption is declining, and they've returned commercial whaling. Yeah. So they're doing it themselves. Yep. So that's all that we got about this article. Let's move on to the next one. This next picture a nice is picture coming up here. a pizza. Looks like a pizza, doesn't it? It does, but it's not <laughs> a pizza. That's a two-dimensional polymer. Well, a representation of one, anyway. MIT scientists create two-dimensional polymers as strong as steel. Scientists at MIT have been trying for two decades to make a two-dimensional polymer something that all their theories and models suggest it was possible, but they could never actually get around to creating one in a laboratory. Now it seems that they have one. It's stronger than steel and as light as plastic. I got news for you. It is plastic. It is plastic. And it's, it's only strong. one atom thick. Yep. So this thing is, it's going to be real light. Well, a polymer is any of a class of substances composed of very large molecules, which are multiples of a simpler chemical unit called a, po a monomer. Let mm -hmm. me give an example of ethylene gas mm -hmm. and polyethylene. 
which is a very useful industrial plastic. Mm -hmm. uh, you probably have it in your house as dish, dishware. Yeah. Okay. So plant, prior to the breakthrough, all polymers formed one-dimensional spaghetti-like chains. The, 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 the breakthrough here is this new material is a two-dimensional polymer that self-assembles itself. That's redundant, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> self-assembles into sheets. Yes. So it forms these, these flat sheets instead of long, skinny pieces of spaghetti. I used to weld polypropylene and polyethylene. It can be done, yeah. It's it's actually kind of pleasant to do, except I didn't like the smell. The smell is, yeah, I like the smell of burning polyethylene. <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't want it to smell like it's burning because <laughs> if you do, it, it probably is burning. Well, a two-dimensional polymer is something that theories and models suggest is possible but can never be actually created. Well, now they done did it. Okay. Well, this is what happens with carbon molecules. The, the, no, the number of different ways that you can put together carbon with other things to make molecules. It's is, a lot. I, I would say that it might be infinite. It's, just, yeah. it's hard to know. I think it probably isn't infinite, actually, but nevertheless. Okay, should we go on? Yeah, I think we should. We covered that subject. I we mean, have. More to, more to come from this thing, because this is a breakthrough. Yeah, this, is, uh, this next one is from the BBC, and we have we a, picture a picture of a, a, of a racing sled. car, huh? And that thing... Oh, the, there's a bobsled. The, fa the, 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 the uh, caption says it's a two-man bobsled, but I only see one man. I only see one person in that. <laughs> well, maybe it's a two-man bobsled with one man in it. Maybe the back guy <laughs> fell out. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. This, this looks scary to me. I don't think you could get me into one of those. Well, this is about the <clears throat> Winter Olympics, so let's put yep. me up And this is um, the BBC reporting. Will the Beijing Games be green and clean? Yeah, well, China has promised to deliver a green and clean Winter Olympics. Organizers say they prioritize uh, protecting native species, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and cutting down on resources used. Extraordinary as the efforts have been, there have been criticisms. Now, one of the things, Tom, in this article is they describe some of the things that these people did. Yeah. And they were indeed extraordinary. Okay. What a, I don't have a note about that. What I do have is a note is that this will be the first Winter Olympics to rely entirely on artificial snow. Yes. And producing artificial snow is both energy and resource intensive. Yes. Okay. It but, would require division, diversion of water from existing reservoirs. Right. This isn't a plus. No, it's not. But I don't think you can blame that on the on the Chinese. They know that at a certain point in time they're going to need snow. Yes. And they can't depend on and they, the they guy were, up there to give it yeah, to them. Yeah, and they were prepared to make their own snow, and that's exactly what they've that's had to do. That's what they're doing. Some events will be held in the middle of a nature reserve. This is not supposedly a good thing. Yeah. The ski runs have been conducted. Constructed in the middle of the Song Shan Nature Reserve in Yang Qing. <laughs> I hope. One of the things that came up a lot in the last few days is that there's a ski jump and there's cooling towers in the background. So a lot of people <laughs> thought they were a nuclear. Um, well, uh, this is this is the, a t part of the takeaway. The construction required removing more than twenty thousand trees. And transplanting them. They transplanted Well, they said they're, they pledged to transplant them, transplanting well, them afterwards. Okay. I'm they're going to bring them back. They're going to bring them back. Well, let's move on here to Monday, trees. Okay. February the 7th. We got a very ugly picture coming up. Here. Yeah, we have an ugly pic let's see picture. If I can get this that is from picture. Clean Technica. I pushed that. It's there. a picture of a bird bath. Here, and we get the picture. And that is the Marshall Fire. This is what was left after the Marshall Fire. And you'll know, it, it's always bizarre, I think, to huh? see these fires and see that some buildings survived. Well, there was a house there. It's, yeah. You can't see it anymore. Yeah. And a bird bath in the front yard. Some things are destroyed and other things are And the house not. right behind it is sitting there unscathed. Well, I don't, Looks think, like it is. I don't think I would want to be somebody who lived in that house. I'll bet that place really smelled of smoke. <laughs> I bet it does. Okay, what do you got for a title? Boulder sued Big Oil for climate damages. 
Then the Marshall Fire happened. If you want to read an interesting article, this is one that's interesting. Good article, huh? Four years ago, Boulder, Colorado sued ExxonMobil and Suncor Energy for climate change-related damages and ad adaption, adaptation expenses. They estimated the damage at over $100 million by 2050. They vastly uh, overestimated the time and underestimated the price. This one fire cost, cost them well, over I, a billion dollars. I got some dollars. numbers there. Yeah, at go ahead. the end of December, the Marshall Fire devastated Boulder County, laying waste to more than 6,000 acres and incinerating more than 1,000 homes and seven commercial buildings, all at a projected cost of a billion dollars. They so, estimated the damage at hundred million, and it's coming out in you know, one year. In one year, they estimated a hundred a hundred million dollars over thirty some odd years, and it's been a billion dollars in one year. And they say in the article that the Marshall Fire was hardly the only one, or even the largest fire in Colorado. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Should we go on? Yeah, I guess more on there, but we let's let's move on here. We got an interesting picture of that is this is Lymondale, perhaps I don't know. Looks like Lymondale, it Lymondale, Lemondale. It's yeah. in New South Wales, whatever it is. Well, this is fascinating to me because I look at that and I see those solar panels are not short. I mean, they're probably five feet long each, which means that you know this is big. This is huge. <laughs> But you know, looking at the shadows, 349 megawatts. Yeah. We, got one, we got five megawatts right here yeah. in town. And I'm looking at this and thinking those panels have to be per, something like eight feet off the ground. And there's lots and lots and lots of room between the, the, uh, the what they call the strings of panels. And I think that's set up for agri agriculture under those panels. I would hope that they would. It makes so much sense. It does. I, I don't see, I mean, this is going to cost extra to do it this way. I don't see any reason why they would do that if they you have two to... screens of income. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Investors submit 34 gigawatts of wind, solar, and storage for a renewable zone in Australia. Okay, this is from PV Magazine. The state government of New South Wales has, has reported a, quote, huge end quote, response to the registration of interest process for the Southwest Renewable Energy Zone. Over 34 gigawatts of wind, solar, and energy storage proposals were received after the state went looking for three gigawatts. That's 10 times. So it's more, it's more actually a little bit more than 11 <laughs> times. And, you know, this is a huge amount. And, and, they could accept more than three gigawatts. They just went looking for three gigawatts, but there's room for a lot more than that. People want to sell them, sell them energy. Yeah. They say we're buying, and a lot more people yeah. responded than they thought we were yeah. going to respond. There was another article that was interesting today, the and, and it was that the natural gas facilities in Australia are kind of not, the, the sale of electricity from natural gas is declining, even though... The Morrison government was wanted to subsidize it to uh, br bring the country out of its COVID-19 slowdown. Uh -huh. But at the same time, renewable energy is just taking over. And again, you know, even subsidized natural gas, it's not going to it's not going to compete. So what are they doing with all this natural gas they got there? Selling it to Japan. OK. You know, but it's not as profitable as it used to be. OK. What will we do now? Go on, or do you We've have more? We've got another picture coming up. We do. It's a picture of a battery. Actually, it's a it, graphic of they, a battery. They don't call it a battery. They say they call it a... I'm looking at a battery. Yeah, I am too. <laughs> I'm looking at one. But the article says it's it's it's, it's a crystal. <laughs> well, they're talking... I think when they talk about crystals, they're talking about what's inside the battery. Well, you and I both agree that's a battery. Yeah, that's a battery. Okay. You hand it to... Any of my kids, and they'll all say, yep, Pop, that's, that's a battery. A battery. <laughs> Making designer crystals, it's easier with a new targeted particle bonding strategy. You know, they, they keep coming up with these new things. It's crazy. Clean Technica is the source of this. Colloids are microparticles evenly distributed in a fluid. Crystals made from colloids are valuable 
in a wide range of applications such as batteries, fuel cells, sensors, solar cells, and catalysts. Scientists have learned how to use them to form a crystal structure. And the implications of that are kind of like the implications of a 2D polymer. I'm reading my notes here and I'm not even going to tell you. I'm not, I'm not going to share my oh, notes. Oh, your notes are not <laughs> the kinds of things you want to share. Well, a new, new strategy creates precise regions with specific chemical and physical properties on the surface of these crystal particles. Yeah. They're doing new... New research here. This, this, well, this it's like they're, they're, they've got a new way to make crystals. Yeah. You know, and again, when I was working in the chemical industry, we used to make crystals. Uh -huh. And, you know, this was something, our intent was not to make crystals. Our intent was to make some particular uh, uh, chemical really pure. But in the process, it would, it would just make a crystal. And, you know, it's easy to make crystals. But here, what they're doing is they're making Kind of, it's kind of like designer crystals that have. That's what they call yeah. it, making designer crystals. Yeah, that's exactly what they call it. And that's a little special. Okay, should we go on? Yeah, I think so. Nice picture of a solar plant in California. Oh, bring that one up there. Yep. This is from Sierra Club Angeles cha uh, chapter. I would imagine those those panels follow the sun. I don't know. Well, I don't know either, but I would imagine they do. So otherwise, they'd be horizontal, I would think. I don't know. Well, I don't. We're we're here in Vermont. We don't know what they do in California. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's a picture up there, anyhow. That's solar power in California. Well, yeah. You, you could kid me about about the, the 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 fact that they're in California, but you can't fool me. They are solar panels. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> what do you have for a title? More cities transitioning to 100% renewable energy. Yeah. Well, that's good news. Los Angeles County, Beverly Hills, Redondo Beach decided to give up, to go up to 100% renewable energy as the default rate beginning in 2022. By the end of this year, more than 2 million people will be receiving 100% renewable energy in Los Angeles and Ventura counties. Well, as 200 cities across the country have joined Sierra Club's Ready for 100 campaign yep. by committing to 100% renewable energy. Yeah. Choosing 100% clean energy is acknowledging the major role that community choice aggregation programs play in further reducing G greenhouse gas emissions. We talked about community choice aggregation. Didn't we? Many times, yeah. Yeah. There's yeah. a... Uh, a town right near us in, in Massachusetts that's that's on a community it's, choice. It's uh, Greenfield. Well, I wasn't thinking of Greenfield. Oh, really? But, uh, Greenfield does. Greenfield, is the, so yeah. there's two towns at least. That, What's, oh, there's a bunch in Massachusetts now. Well, this one's near Vermont. Isn't Greenfield near Vermont? Yes, but it's not Greenfield. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, okay. It is near Vermont and it isn't Greenfield. Okay. Well, we got a nice picture here coming up. This is a what scary. What in the world are these things? That's a, this is a scary article. Let's this see is they're called the Wall of Wind. The at, Wall of Wind at Florida International University, and this article comes from CNN. Preparing for Category Six hurricane. Category Six. Yeah. Man, a new facility will test winds of 200 miles per hour and storm surge. 200 mile an hour wind. That's what they're saying. That'd flatten just about every building in sight. Well, the article shows a picture of a roof being blown off a house. So. Yeah. The 12 fan wall of wind at Florida International University is, well, you're supposed to read that. <laughs> oh, I'll do that if you wish. The 12 fan wall of wind at Florida International University is used as a test site for engineering against tornadoes, hurricanes, and other types of windstorms. It can generate winds of 160 miles an hour. Unfortunately, that is no longer enough. So they're going for a new wall of wind speed of 200 miles 200. an hour. Well, and the yeah. article has a lot of pictures. Yeah. 99 photos in it. 99. 99 of them. Okay. And there's a nice video in there, yes. a short one. Watch what winds over 100 miles an hour can do to this house, and it just takes the roof right off it. Well, you know, I remember... Um, 
some people in Florida sued because of, because I, I forget which hurricane it was that came in, but it, it just destroyed every house in a building project. And so the people in the building project sued the developers of the project. And the developers and, and, of the project said, wait a minute, we, we were at spec. The hurricane yeah. wasn't. Yeah. You know, we had utility poles that were bent double. Yeah. That's, you know, this is way off the ma charts as far as, and that's, you know, basically what happened. Well, they, they made their point. Yeah. The utility poles were designed to, the, the houses were designed to withstand something like 150 miles an hour, which is impressive. Which is what? And but and the utility poles. You can't poles stand were, up with 150 no, miles. No, not even close. The utility poles were designed to withstand a higher yeah. speed. And I'm, I'm to some degree, I'm just giving figures that are kind of what I recall. But my recollection was that was 180 miles an hour, and they were whoop, bent double. So, well, okay. Climate change is showing us that storms are getting stronger. Yes. Moving slower and holding more water than ever before. This is something we've been talking about and talking yeah. about and talking about. And they're also rapidly intensifying, which is something they worry about. Because if, right. if it rapidly intensifies, it almost always turns into a doozy. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I was actually in Massachusetts for Hurricane Bob. I was on uh, Duxbury Bay, and my house was on a, on a peninsula at Duxbury Bay. And... Um, I was there for Hurricane Bob, which cut, cut our electric power for a week. And then I was there for the perfect storm, which cut our electric power for a week. <laughs> well, and that's a fun. Literally, I went, I went to work in the morning and got there and everybody was leaving. <laughs> because I didn't know that this storm was coming because nobody knew only a few hours before. Yeah. But they had got word in, in, the, in the place where I worked. Okay. We got a pic interesting we have a, picture this here. This is an interesting picture. Of floating homes. This is not floating homes in Holland. Um, no, these, these are right here in the good old U.S. Yeah. I uh, was reading an article by a guy who lives in one of these floating homes. Matter of fact, it looks very much like that blue one. Oh, okay. And uh, you don't suffer anything by living in a floating home. No. He had all the uh, amenities. Yeah. Well, that can be done with a lot of things. If you can yeah. be off grid and have all the amenities. Well, question. The article says it's a question, I guess. Why the Dutch embrace floating homes? Well, I'm going to answer that question. Yep. This is from the BBC. With sea levels rising and supercharged storms uh, cause uh, water swelling, floating neighborhoods offer an experiment in flood defense that could allow f coastal communities to better withstand climate change. In the land-scarce but densely populated Netherlands, demand for such homes is growing. And I have to say, I forget what the percentage of the Netherlands is below sea level. A lot it's, of it. It's a lot, a lot of, of it. It might be half of it. Yeah. And, you know. I mean, that's where it came from, you know. That's yeah. where the windmill came from. Do you remember in the early 1950s, there was a, a bad storm in the North Sea and the and the... And the the dikes were breached, and huge areas of, of the Netherlands wound up being... I don't a, remember that. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to argue with you. It happened. Yeah, it happened, and it took them months to get all the water out. You know? Yeah. And they had trees that died, and they had probably fields of, of uh, tulips that died, and you name it. The article is very interesting. It's inter it's for, for, if you've got the time, look, look it up. Yeah. These floating communities are inspiring more ambitious Dutch-led projects in flood-prone nations, from French Polynesia to the Republic of the Maldives. And a picture of the Maldives, which is a chain of, of 26 atolls in the Atlantic Ocean, it's middle of nowhere. It lies southwest of Sri Lanka and India, about 500 miles from the Asian mainland. Well, there's one picture there of what they're doing in the Maldives. They're taking a natural atoll, which is about six or seven islands arranged in a circle mm -hmm. with a lagoon in the middle. And they're building homes in the in lagoon. The yeah. And we're not talking 10 or 12. It looks like a couple of hundred in there. Yeah. There's a picture of it in the article. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We're up to Wednesday, February 9th. We are. We and are. And we have an we article from Clean Technica. 
And we well, have a picture of- Let's get this one up here of a Ford Transit. The, the first Ford E-Transit. It's e not Transit. just a Ford Transit, it's an all-electric Ford Transit. That's right, the first Ford E-Transit coming off the lines and a bunch of people who are very excited. Well, the E-Transit is like a delivery van. Yeah. Or the Transit is like a delivery right. van. And the E-Transit is simply an E-version of yeah. it. And this 40 is, Transit electric work vans are leaving the factory in Kansas City and are on their way to 300 business and commercial customers. You're reading They've been my selected. Part. I'm reading your part. <laughs> you can read the rest of it. Okay. More than 10,000 have been ordered. Ford CEO Jim Farley says his company intends on being the Tesla of electric commercial vehicles. There's and, a one minute video, but it's not very encouraging. What does this tell you that? the CEO of Ford would want to be the Tesla of, <laughs> of commercial vehicles. I didn't vehicles. catch that one. This is like, I didn't catch what? That. What? Really? <laughs> Tesla wants to be the Ford. <laughs> well, I, as I said, there's a one minute video there. Yeah. But, Ford has invested $100 million to make its Kansas City assembly plant ready to build this e-transit delivery van. Okay, and it's added 150 union workers. Well, that's part of the deal. Yeah. They gotta be union workers to help manufacture them. This E-Transit is part of the $30 billion investment Ford is making in electrification between now and the end of 2025. That's coming up quick. By the end of 2023, Ford will have a global capacity to produce 600,000 battery electric vehicles annually. So they're looking at the near future coming up. Yes, they are. The internal combustion engine is over, folks. <laughs> it, yeah, I think you're not the first. I mean, it's going to take a that. little while for it to, to filter down to everybody, but it's over. It's um, it's not going to last much longer. They're going to stop making them. Well, here we go again with one of these guys. We've seen these before. We have, but not this particular one, I don't think. Well, that's that's kind of uh, not working, is it? Doesn't look like it's working. What? Doesn't look like it might be working. Well, it, that head on it looks a, a little unusual. Well, these things are all over the West. You know, I looked at the Roscoe Wind Farm in Texas, which has 680 turbines or something like that. And you can see the, te the, wind, the turbines f from a satellite view. And on the same land as the turbines are all these things, nodding donkeys. Yeah. And you can Gazillions see- Gazillions of them. Gazillions everywhere. of them. And you can see that some of them are not operating. Some of them have fallen apart. Some of them, some of them have oil spills next to them that were never really cleaned up. Uh -huh. So the land around them is black. Anyway, this is from CNN. And what do you have for title of the article? Huge profits at BP and Shell revive calls for a windfall tax to tackle fuel poverty. Oh man, in the earnings reports, BP posted an annual profit of almost $12.9 billion, and Shell reported a profit of $19.3 billion after what it described as a, quote, momentous, end quote, year. Meanwhile, households are suffering energy poverty. This has people calling for a tax on windfall profits. Well, it makes sense. Yeah. The huge profits coincide with the announcement that energy bills for most UK households will rise by 54% in April. Yep. So they're looking at these guys making all sorts of money and they're saying, why is my energy bill going up so fast? Yeah, I mean, and th this, is, this happens every once in a while where energy is in tight demand, it drives the price of oil, yeah. the price yep. of gas yep. up. The people who have very little to pay for it wind up having to pay far more, and the oil companies and gas companies are making a lot of money. They're whistling it all the way to the bank. Yeah, absolutely. And does it sound fair to you? No. No? Doesn't sound fair to me either. Well, anyway. We the last one coming up, I think. The last one is coming up. And this is Secretary a, Granholm. We have a picture of Jennifer Granholm. The, the, when she actually did the, uh, the uh, thing at at, uh, what was it that she, where she did this, the EU, she was wearing a new hairdo. Uh-huh. So it's, it's a little bit more puffy than this. Oh. 
<laughs> U.S. Energy Secretary ties renewables to world peace. Which I told you was going to happen. Yeah. Oil price is uh, the source, the greatest peace plan ever could be based on renewable energy, U.S. Secretary of Energy Jennifer Granholm said in her opening remarks at the U.S. EU Energy Council ministerial this week. The issue of energy security has been highlighted due to Russia's actions in Ukraine. And that's going on. I hear, that's all over the radio. News. It's all over the. It's all over everything. It, you know, I look for. And we don't know what's really happening. No, we don't know what's happening, and and I I don't think anybody else does either. To tell including you the including Putin. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it, but the thing is, I think I think Putin could make so much money for Russia, and and issue in you know prosperity in Russia without being confrontational or trying to prove that he's stronger than anybody else. Yeah, but I think he's got an ego problem. Well, I think he's got an ego problem, and I think that he's got a, um, a problem with a lack of imagination. Um, yeah. The, the, the problem that people have now is they look at the past and they think that that's what the future is going to be. We are in a position today where you that's can't do future. that. The future is going to be different. Yeah. We know this because yeah. it can't be what it is because, it, and and um, you know the the old paradigm is is uh, is uh, baseload power, and most people say, well, we need baseload power because if we don't have that, we won't have the lights turn on in the bathroom at two o'clock on Sunday morning. But we're developing baseload power as we speak. Well, we're developing it's something just happening. that replaces baseload power. It's replacing, yeah. Well, it's serving as baseload power. Yeah. Because you got solar, you got wind, and bingo, you got storage. Yes, that's the bingo. <laughs> and you know, I ask people, what is baseload power? You know, you're saying that we need baseload power. What is it? Nobody seems to know. That's what keeps going on when everybody shuts the lights off. <laughs> well, the ba what is the base load? The base load is the lowest load that will be demanded of a power station at any time. Okay, that's and if you're, it's it can be the, the lowest load in a week or a month or a year, but for if you're designing a base load, when power everybody plant, goes to sleep, what's left? Yeah, and <laughs> if you're going to design a base load power plant, you want to have a, a base load that's you're going to have to design that plant to supply a load that is the lowest load that it will ever be asked to, to deliver. That's a good way of describing it. And and the reason they do that is because it saves a lot of money because you don't have the bells and whistles on the plant to to allow it to to change its output. But the problem is, it's like Vermont Yankee was a base load pl a plant. They were going to give us power at a price too cheap. For us to, to refuse. They were going to give us a deal too good to turn down. <laughs> and we turned it down. <laughs> and we turned it down. They were offering us six and a half cents per kilowatt hour. Hydro Quebec offered us six cents per kilowatt hour. And I'm seeing power purchase agreements for sun backed up by battery four, at four under half. four cents per yeah. kilowatt hour. How in the world is nuclear power going to uh, compete with that? How is coal going to compete? How are well, any of these going to compete? Coal can't compete. Coal can't compete. They're, they're just not building coal plants anymore. Yeah. They are in China, but that's about yeah. it. And what's happening here is Vladimir Putin believes, you know, that he's got this clout because he's the source of the natural gas. Well, he, he, Russia could be the source of a lot of things. And they could make a huge amount of money building wind turbines, building solar panels, supplying silicon. Supplying, Absolutely good. You know, but they're not moving in that direction. Somebody needs neodymium, you supply them with neodymium. But instead, they want to supply natural gas, and the rest of the world is wanting to turn away from natural gas. It's That's what's a, happening. Not a good deal. Okay, here is our last so slide. I, well, I, I just wanted to, we've just got one more thing to say. What's that? Well, put her you want back. To go back to yeah, Jennifer we'll Granholm? Put her back, because I got a quote. No country has been held hostage to access to the sun. <laughs> That's her quote. Yeah, I saw that. That was This beautiful. is not just an energy and climate issue. It is also potentially the greatest peace plan that ever existed to be able to build energy independence from clean energy. 
Thank you for Jennifer Granholm. Yeah, good point. Absolutely. The transition to a low carbon economy is a priority for the Biden administration, yeah. which has proposed billions in spending on new wind and power generation capacity and electric vehicles. And yeah. we've talked about that. That's that's happening. So have a shockingly lovely week. That's what it says. That's what it says. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> Let's, uh, that's pretty shocking, isn't it? Yes, it is. Isn't it? Shockingly lovely. So why don't you put us up and we can wave goodbye. That's what we always do. See you next time. Adios. Come back. You'll come back and see us now, you hear? You always say that. <laughs>